And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, the Grandmaster of Lonely Final Boss Studios, and the, ma and the, man, cur the man currently... Dealing with dealing with his coffee fixation, and cre and creator of the upcoming RPG, Rising Spire, the one and only don't don't call him Tito, but he is Ortiz. <laughs> yeah, I've never been haven't been called that before, but uh, normally go by Frank. Mm -hmm. So, hello, and how you doing? I'm doing. You're probably sick of people saying to be Frank around you. Uh, actually, I'm usually the one saying it to them to piss them off, so. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just figured that cert that certain, well, I've joked that I've wanted to change my name to Next so I could skip ahead in lines. Ah, uh, I see, I see, yes, Next. <laughs> that, that would be me, thank you. <laughs> so. I'd like to open with a bit of the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, what was your... F well, since Rising Spire is ver is described as a Final Fantasy-inspired turn-based RPG, um, what was your what was your first introduction to that console style of RPGs? Well, it's a, it's a pretty good question. Uh kind of a, a mix between two titles actually and funny enough i was talking about this not even 30 minutes ago uh in our discord we have this game where it's uh you put a, a screenshot of a game and someone has to try to guess it and uh for my turn i put a screenshot of legend of the dragoon um and uh we were talking about four discs for for two different types of games that and also final fantasy 8 and back at the time when I was first introduced to this genre, especially on console, um, it were the, it was those two games, and both of them are games that have four discs. So my entire childhood is just remembering opening up and like swapping out discs back to back. So <laughs> both of those uh, simultaneously were my my first influence to to the genre. I could certainly see it, and um, I will admit it. I will admit I have. With Legend of Dragoon, um, that's a thing that a lot that a lot of people haven't tried to rep to replicate. Um, the only the only thing I didn't like about it was the way it handled items. <laughs> Just a little, yeah, a little bit um, stingy, if you ask me. <laughs> uh, maybe that's where I got some of my uh, my practices from. People hate me for it. Um, but uh... <laughs> well, on the other hand. I'm pretty sure you're familiar. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the rainy day paradox when it comes to um, items yes. in RPGs. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. I can't use one of my 99 mega elixirs. What if I need it for later, sir? And then you the get more powerful ones. <laughs> it's like ultra mega potions, and then all the other ones are no longer useful. No, I'm, no, I'm talking uh, about that guy. I'm talking about that guy who will hold on to it till the end of time, even if he's at the final friggin' boss. Oh yeah, but then you got all the different variants, you know, because. I don't know about you, but I'll be saving up those potions, and I'll have 99 of those. Then I get mega potions, or high potions, 99 of those. Mega potions, 99. <laughs> and so far, you have all the tiers of potions mm -hmm. maxed out. You're like, yeah, I can't use any of them. Yeah. Um, it is kind of amusing that you bring up F um, Final Fantasy VIII, because, well, that's the, that's the one that everybody tells me I'm supposed to hate, but, um, yes. the, checks don't, but the checks haven't cleared. <laughs> and I think I can't help. I think a lot of people who claim that they hate it haven't played it. They're just transplanting what Spoonie said about it all those years ago. Yeah, I think I'm gonna get burned at the stake for saying this, but uh, it'll be a yeah. good company. <laughs> I I love Final Fantasy VIII, and I think the worst thing about it that cannot be denied is its junk junction system and the way that it handles magic. That is just a broken system and is completely just terrible. But besides that, if you get past the worst thing ever created, the rest of the game is pretty fun. Most people uh, talk about the story as well, but I mean, it's a, when it comes it's a to junction, game. 
Um, since you mentioned Bert, you mentioned that you're going to get burned at the stake. I may as well follow suit. Um, <laughs> I would rather take junctioning than that learn from items thing in FF nine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Very fair. Especially since uh, every re-release of uh, Final Fantasy VIII includes an option in the menu that just says "fill up all my stock," and then you just have maxed out magic. Mm -hmm. So no, I uh, strongly agree on that one. Um, and I'm the the idea of learning abilities through items isn't something I'm opposed to. Well, Path of Path of Exile kind of does that with slotting in abilities, and it works. Um, I had said that it's a good idea in the wrong kind of game, because that's the mm -hmm. kind of thing that would be much better served in a PC style RPG where you ha where um you don't have as much of a linear progression when it comes to your equipment, since even Final Fantasy is still adhering to the Dragon Quest model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, that's that's a good point, actually. Um, or anything, any type of game that offers additional content, right? So if it's it, what it replay value is like, and as long as those things aren't required, right? So if you don't have to go around learning from items in order to succeed, um, it could be an interesting way to increase the replay value of a of a title. I know so. that some I know that some people defend it by saying you can pick you can pick what you want you don't have to permanently learn, but even even with that there's still there's still that linear go trend upward. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying that that combined with the le the learn from items and the slow slow pace of actually learning from items. Yeah, you have two things no, in yeah. the mix. Definitely. If, no, I see it do that. Oh, if you had if you had it where you have a bigger variety of loot, like well, an ARPG, which is why I brought up Path of Exile, you can get away with that. Oh yeah, that's that's a good point. Oh, now with that with that in mind, um, was rising was Rising Spires a idea that you had in the back of your mind for a while, or what? Or were its origins a little bit more recent? Um, I'd say a little bit of uh, both. Uh, originally, there is kind of a, a story that uh, that came to birth maybe about five years ago or so. Um, mm -hmm. To a point in which I was going to start working on the development of a dungeon crawl game that had RPG aspects to it. Um, and then this game is actually supposed to be a scoped down... <laughs> version of the uh of the like the prequel to that game so this is kind of the the beginnings of that next step so this game in itself is relatively new in terms of its idea but from um uh, from where it roots from that's been around for a little longer mm -hmm. now taking the taking that into taking that into account um, I suppose one of the big, one of the big questions that I that I'd have to ask is, from the way, from from what I'm looking at with it, is it a case where you where um, ninety nine percent of the time you're mainly get the, you're mainly it's mainly going to be Atlas that you're controlling, not not a whole lot in the way of a party. That was the original design way, way early on, uh, which is why most of the the media that we have that we've shared only has Atlas. At the mm -hmm. moment, we have two other party members. Um, so there is going to be, I think we have about six planned party members in total, uh, not including any from DLCs. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it will have more of that traditional uh, party kind of uh, sense to it. There's the play style in the battle, though, is still geared towards Atlas. It's more linear for like the the growth of the individual party members is more linear, whereas Atlas is kind of if you think of other Final Fantasy titles, how you have these giant maps of like specking into things, mm -hmm. um, you'll have more of a customizable experience with Atlas than your party members. But um, so it's a little toned down version of it. They're still there though. And something that I was curious about when I looked at the 
we when I looked at the weapon variety, which is something I do appreciate. Um, are you treating each each individual weapon almost like a job class? Yes, that's exactly what you're what you're seeing there. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm really big into, you know, classes with, uh, I'm a big JRPG, RPG, and MMO RPG fan, so when it comes to classes, I love it, but I also like the freedom of playstyle, um, and that's what that is. Uh, each one is a different playstyle, a different way to, to be that main character, so, like, if you want Atlas to be more of a mage slash rogue, you can have that going on, um, without having to do any sort of like grinding or building up too much experience in a in a certain weapon. Mm -hmm. Now you the two that you had sh the two that you had shown were the were the um spear and or the uh, wild javelin and the twin blade. Um but you had also hinted at being at being able to switch between weapons on the flies. And given that, is it since we mentioned it being a class, is it going to is it going to be a thing where, based on the situation, switching between weapons is going to be encouraged? Yes, absolutely. So, in fact, uh, there's a lot of parts where we have already where it encourages you to use a different weapon. Um, so, what you want to do with the two weapons is kind of get a synergy, so where you can get the majority of your bases covered. Mm -hmm. Um. So, um, like right now, one of the builds that I, I end up going with is a mix between like a buff debuffing thing and then, uh, and then into a sustain type thing. So you kind of buff yourself up, debuff the enemy, and then you just go full defensive. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's just the way that I play test because it's really hard to die that way. Um, but that's what I really like. I, I want to create these things where. You know, it's it's like multitask, uh, multi-classing in in D and D or whatever the case is. So you basically choose two weapons coming into battle, and you can swap between those uh, freely. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind, it's it sounds like even it's not a case where you're going to be able to switch between every weapon type you have. You have two that you're going to be swapping between when it comes to actual combat. Yes, correct. It's uh, you basically have your primary, secondary loadout. Mm -hmm. So, and that brings me to the third um, part of the part of this particular trinity, that being soul transformations. And I'm guessing this is where a bit of the Legend of Dragoon influence came in. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so um, originally the design for the Soul Transformation was right down the smack the middle as uh, Legend of Dragon, that same kind of concept where now the rest of the battle, you can be in that form. Um, and then having multiple Soul Transformations that are accessible by Atlas. Mm -hmm. So there were a few issues that we ran into with that kind of design that just kind of complicated uh, the battle interface. Um, and one of them, or the experience in general, so let's say you have this more aggressive wolf spirit that you turn into, I don't want to put too many spoilers in here, mm -hmm. um, and you transform, and now while you're in this form, you have access to powerful abilities that focus on like crit, high attack, fast attacks, that kind of stuff, um, but you change your mind and you want to swap to another one, right? So getting married into one form, solving that problem was a little tricky. So I ended up making it a little closer to the limit breaker system, right? Where you build up to something, um, you let it out in one attack, and then you receive the buff from it for some time, right? Mm -hmm. So rather than getting being in that form for the remainder of the battle, you would get maybe like, you know, 10 turns where you have those, those stats increased. Mm -hmm. And since it is... Since there, is, since there is that whole primary and secondary um, thing with weapons, is it a similar thing with soul transformations? Uh, that was always a tricky one. Um, I want them to be used openly and freely. Uh, so there, there was always this challenge between how to simplify the, you know, the battle UI and all that kind of stuff, but also 
have this availability to to open it up and choose and kind of just play around with them. And for that, it, it leaned more into the uh, the summon abilities in most Final Fantasy games. So it's closer to that. You can just open it up, look at what you have, and pick any of them. Mm -hmm. And we're we're talking about the classic version of summon, not the version of summon that where it was a character in and of itself a la in oh uh, yes yes yeah more of the uh the one time in summon hmm. thinking uh <laughs> if it final fantasy 8 just knocks a meter into your forehead you know that kind of stuff mm -hmm. like i like i said the majority of it where it where it could be considered a souped up kind of spell yes exactly Now, with that in with that in mind, I'd like to talk a bit about advancement because it looks like you have something of a skill or a um t or a talent tree where you are able to unlock new talents and then unlock enhancements to those talents. Yes. Um. Yeah. So what you're looking at there then would be the uh, the mastery system for an individual weapon. And the way that that works is each uh, each weapon, like I mentioned before, has its own um, its own style, right? Its own gameplay style, and uh, it has three main abilities plus um, an optional, like a, you can pick one of four different ultimates. Really, you know, powerful abilities, higher cooldowns, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, of the three core abilities there you can choose uh from the images we have up it only shows two we have it to three enhancements now so you pick one of these three enhancements and that kind of ties into the selecting your build before going into battle you can change these at any time as long as you're out of battle you just open up your menu you can switch to a different enhancement mm -hmm. um and then this creates just you know let's say you have uh dual blades that is high damage a high consistent damage to a single target and you want another ability on your other weapon to do some sort of area damage or being able to hit multiple targets so you might adjust your abilities on the other weapon to kind of support that play style mm -hmm. so that's they're, they're relatively small tweaks to it but it, it in a the grand scheme of things it will change the the play style of that weapon yeah and this brings me. This brings me to one issue that a lot of PC RPGs t tend to ha tend to have whenever they introduce skill trees, and some developers have tried to address this, and that is making sure that there isn't the choice paralysis issue or the idea that a um a unlock that you end up getting at one point isn't screwing you over because you didn't pick the right one at that at that given time. So, have you given thought to the ability to respec. Oh, it's like I mentioned it. Uh, you just open up the menu and you could just choose a different one. So it's it is, completely it is, free form. Yeah, so it isn't a, it isn't a case where once where once you pick things down a certain path, you can you are locked into that one. Not at all. So let's say you you know you're in a zone where there are a lot of high armored enemies, and you spec one of your abilities um to lower the the armor even further mm -hmm. and then you go into another area and now they no lo no longer have these hard high armor enemies but there's like a bunch of smaller enemies you can just open up your menu after having one battle and you see oh, okay well there's there's a lot of enemies here you open up the menu you just change it from uh reducing armor over to hitting multiple enemies mm -hmm. and that's it simple as that Now, with that in with that in mind, since the, since there's go, since there's going to be that emphasis, like you mentioned, of weapons as classes, and I don't I, I don't want to do an, do any kind of any kind of spoilers when it comes to the other weapons that are available, but let's focus for a moment on the twin blade and the wild javelin. Um, the ideal thing with any sort of class design is that there is not a cl that there is not or there barely is a class that is a jack of all trades so to speak so what I, so what i'd be what i'd be curious about is 
if uh, is um what would be the things that that each of them would be good at and one of the things that they would not be good at in terms of building ter in terms of building a play style to be aware of so well, this is something i personally have a lot of fun with um i love the the identity of a class or or of a weapon or you know job system and making sure that it's unique and it fulfills a purpose without it being, you know, clear negative either. So, um, the way that I go about that is just picking something, right? So let's say the, the twin blades, uh, you look at twin blades and you already know what you're looking at, right? You're looking at, you know, fast attacks, uh, crit, probably high accuracy, all that kind of stuff. Um, and those are generally what I put as the, I just kind of write those off on the side and say, okay, these are going to be what are what's expected. And we make sure that all of the abilities kind of fulfill those, right? That's the first thing. Um, then the second thing after that is what is its flavor or its theme? Mm -hmm. So now that we have that base settled, um, what they what they excel in, now we create a a theme around that. Right? So how can we really push into that and make it like Kind of go towards okay well with the um the twin blades usually you're gonna have people that are interested in thief classes so you know we haven't gone through past the f first two abilities of the uh of the twin blades just yet but uh so far where my mind's with that one is going to be around wrapping around poisons right so it's going to be more towards the hit often hit fast and if you're disabled in any way there's a mark that's left on them right whether they're bleeding or there's blood or there's poison that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um so you'll you'll see strengths in that and the other thing is this is where unique enemy designs come into play as well because that's what's going to really show what the strengths and the weaknesses to uh to certain weapons are right so just in that example alone if we had an enemy that stuns you very often that could be really annoying or very fulfilling depending on whether or not you're prepared for it with the right weapon. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the non-spoiler way of answering that is lean towards what is expected and make sure that that's uh, definitely there and that it excels greatly at that. Um, and then the second part is introducing enemies that will make that shine or will show off another flaw that it has. And obviously, when I think when I think of when I think of FF and I think of spears, when it comes to say the javelin, there's two things that instantly come to mind. Um, one of the, one of them is is jumping. The other one is crit fishing. <laughs> and the jumping might be pushing things a little bit, but would the javelin be more of a crit fisher? Um, as of right now, uh, not too much. It's uh, kind of took into more of the idea of what someone who who likes javelins might be interested in. And if you look at the stance, and you, you look at a lot of um, classes or jobs that have it not really looking at how they end up being used in the game, but look at the class designs and the job designs, and you'll often see that they're more heavily armored or they lean closer to some form of, um, you know, it's it's like a classy berserker, <laughs> right? Which is where you get into uh, crit fishing. But um, yeah, as of right now, it's uh, it doesn't have high crit. It does have high crit damage. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is leaned more towards being a stable, um, a stable class. Mm -hmm. So going on, going on from the, going on from that, when it comes to the, ta when it comes to the talents that you, that you utilize, I'm guessing, I'm guessing both talents or soul transformations are still going to be using what I believe was SP. Yes, so um, the SP system is something that we're still working with. 
uh, mostly because of the introduction of party members. Originally, SP was you build it up, you transform. Um, but now we want something meaningful for the party members to be able to do, mm -hmm. right? Some form of ultimate attack that they can build up to, similar to Limit Breakers. Um, so now trying to decide how we, we handle the two of those combined is one of the most recent topics. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's nothing set in stone with that one just yet. We still need to play test a lot of it. We have uh, another version of the demo that's more that that's closer to what we're building out in the main game. Mm -hmm. uh, that should be coming out sometime in May. Yep. Um, so we're looking at doing almost like a, a fill up bar, like a gauge for the transformation. And then the um, the ultimates working on a, a form of currency, right? Like, uh, it feels weird to call it that, but like um, a, a resource control, right? So if you think of, uh, if you're familiar with like World of Warcraft by any chance? Yeah, for better yeah, or for worse. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Most so, you know, like, days. yeah, no, I've, I've been on, um, on the uh, classic Burning Crusade lately. So, um, yeah, definitely for worse. Um, the uh, You have, especially in retail, there's more resource focus on different class, but even back in the older versions, you had mana, rage, energy, focus, mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff. And uh, that's what we're looking at building right now. Mm -hmm. So one of our characters has a currency called Vengeance. So when he gets hit, um he produces this this vengeance and also when he does certain abilities he generates more more vengeance and as this character has more uh has higher vengeance they it reduces the damage they take and they deal more damage which this is unique only to that party member and then they can use those stacks of vengeance in order to release an ultimate attack but at that point their vengeance stacks go to zero right so creating this interesting play style for this this party member is what we're going at rather than making it the traditional oh make bar go up yeah so now there's also a choice there that says well should i even bother using his, their ability right now or should i hold it off and it gives some tactical value to it as well um so yeah on the kickstarter page there was mention of ex of exploration of lore and a lot of people, when they think when they think of lore in video games, they're probably thinking of the many videos that Vati Vidya has done on the on the Souls games, or people like Smoke Town have done on a variety of diff of different topics, including Blasphemous. But with with within the setup that you have, have you? It sounds like you've bit you've taken extra steps to have it that the fantasy setting where your where Rising Spire takes place is as much living and has as much history as an as a setting should as a setting should in order to stand out. Yes. Um I would say one of our strengths is our lore. Um it's very fleshed out, very carefully brought together over many years. Um and it's it's a world that, you know, me and me and the team members, we all really care deeply about it. To the point where if you <laughs> you were to ask any of us a specific piece about the lore, we'd be able to tell you and recount it as though it's a real world. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to share that is is kind of just really exciting. Um, we have so many opportunities where we could just say, hey, well, I mean, the way the reason why this land was designed this way was because of this, this, this and this. Mm -hmm. And we can go ahead and just leave something in the world to to show you to 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 make that connection so uh yeah having the the lore implemented in the game is is one of the most exciting parts in fact i'm usually more fearful that uh all these things that i have pride in and and leaving those little nuggets around of of the history um will just you know get ignored by a lot of people that just skip through text if hurts my heart a little learned, bit but if we've learned anything from the from the souls games over the years while some people may ignore it, some will most definitely not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I I, uh, I hope that one day someone uh, challenges me with the lore and says, hey, well, you said this here, but in the game this happened. I would be so happy if that kind of thing happened. Yeah, Be're like, damn, you're right. I, I messed up. <laughs> and um, 
Well, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, the the ultimate expression of that whole of uh, that whole lore thing is some of the videos that say text talks battle tech d does or or um Black Pants Legion's text d does where he was able to do a 90 minute video just on one mech. <laughs> yeah. Now granted that now granted the mech in question was the Marauder, but it was more than just the stats of it. The world that the Marauder w took um, was introduced into the variant. Some of the examples of variants, although going through all the variants would probably make his editor kill himself. Um, <laughs> going through going through the successors and and some of the side types with that with that and its greater impact. I mean. One of the things that uh, that we do with with all of our weapons is we also want to uh, with the two that we have and we want to continue to do this is they have lore around themselves as well. The weapons, although they may seem ordinary, have a rich history behind them. Why is this a weapon that is useful to Atlas in his journey? Uh, not for just a mystical reason. Perhaps there's you know more powerful ones than others, but some of them are sentimental or have historical value. Um, and every piece, like we. <laughs> we're looking at at recipes we're like well what would the people of that area have um what kind of uh what kind of berries would exist what kind of fish um all that kind of stuff in fact uh even atlas's attire uh funny enough everyone's always like one of the first things a lot of people see is they're like hey that reminds me of uh, avatar lost airbender and it's it's really cool because that was totally by accident but it's Definitely on point because the, his attire comes from a um, from a village nearby that is called Dohan, and it's a fishing village. Mm -hmm. So all of the cloth, the colors, everything is made based off of what a fishing village would have available to them. So you look at the water tribe, and it's very likely that they made that attire based off of the same thing, right? Yeah. So same influences breeds very similar results. Yeah, there's with now of course of course when it of course when you're dealing with water tribe you have to be a little more specific between north or between north or south but even <laughs> with any of the four nations just saying that something looks like something from one of the four nations um doesn't tell doesn't tell the whole story I mean you look at you look at something like say the like say the Earth Kingdom and you've got You've got you have. Oh, you got a lot in Earth Kingdom. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of variants. Yeah, in part, in part because in part because of the, in part because of the inspirations and just be and just because having the with the amount of size that each of the nations has, there's go, there's going to be little sub little sub variants all over the place. I mean, even the Water Tribe it has the 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 swamp, the Froggy Swamp. Yeah, so. um, Buddha Bubba, as Chuck has referred to him. Um, <laughs> but, and I did, I and it's funny that you bring that up because one of the things I was going to bring up is that this the type of fantasy that you're going with from what I, from what I saw isn't doing what's what some ultra traditionalists consider fantasy. Is that because? I have um I have had a bit of a resentment to the idea that what I call the Tolkien melting pot is what you're supposed to do if it's supposed to be fantasy. Um oh. one of my one of my favorite tabletop games of all time Exalted was noteworthy for outright trying to avoid going down that route as best as it could and doubling down on um the on the fertile crescent in some areas and yeah i mean um oh go on well with, with rising spire the the vibe that i the vibe that i ended up getting to a certain extent was um leaning is cert, is certainly a guest alt much like much like the inspirations but leaning a little bit into um, into into Celtic or Scottish. 
Yeah, actually, it does have a good amount of uh, influence from there as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I was, I was going to bring up is that it's, uh, it's actually world mythology in general that we pull a lot of influences from, right? So mythology as a general topic is very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, to to me and, and the artists, we talk about it all the time, and we pull up new deities and whatnot, and we're like, hey, well, this has this. And um, so we pull in from a lot of sources, and um, it kind of just mixes in together. Sometimes you'll see in some areas a little bit more influences from specific places, um, while others have others. Uh, like, we have some Egyptian influences that are a little bit more prominent in a different area. Mm -hmm. um, but uh yeah that's uh that's a big part of it it it, it is kind of a, a mosh posh of just a bunch of different influences and and lately uh celtic has been pretty pretty high up there that and, and nordic as well yeah and well given the amount of um of 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 um of folk metal that i end up listening to i'm not one to talk <laughs> oh but I, given given the Final Fantasy inspiration, that certainly makes sense, since one of the one of the key things with Final Fantasy's mythos has been taking notes, names, what have you, from a massive variety of cultures, and yes. in some in some regards, even taking nods from pop culture. A a big example I give with that is um, Yojimbo in Final Fantasy X. Who, at least from at least from at least from the way I saw it, Yojimbo was meant to be one giant nod to um, Lone Wolf and Cub. Oh, uh, okay, I see. Yeah, um, you've got that. You, ha you, you have the you have Gil you have of course Gilgamesh. Um, yes, <laughs> although it's a little uh, more on the nose. Yeah, um. I mean, you have you have that you have a wide variety of the t of the ultimate of the ultimate weapons that have shown up that have shown up throughout the series. Um, whether that be Excalibur, not to be confused with Excalibur, or um, Kaladbog, or um, I, be I believe I believe Gungnir has been has been used a few times. And of course, it's been used by Odin plenty of times. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean that that's pretty in interesting that you brought that up because I I really never made that connection, but it's it's really true. Um, Final Fantasy does that a lot, and here we are doing it a lot. So uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it just goes to show how much we've played. But the um, the style of fantasy that I referred to a lot of. A lot of PC style RPGs is what I like to call Gestalt fantasy. Because mm -hmm. if you look at if you if you if you look at an an instance of say, um, I'll use Dragon Age as an example. The influences that Dragon Age has are are fairly obvious. A a fair bit of a fair bit of Irish a fair bit of Irish fantasy, a fair bit of, um. Of war of Warhammer because you cannot convince me the demons in Dragon Age are not based on Warhammer demons, <laughs> <laughs> but it generally le it generally leaves it at that. Whereas with Final Fantasy, even in the early days, trying to say that it was medieval that it's been medieval fantasy when it started out is a stretch to say the least. For God's sakes, we had airships in the well, first the game. The funny thing there though is. Yeah, the the early one was really the early ones were really cool because they had that, that's the whole topic of RPGs being western and eastern, right? Just having these two different genres cuz Final Fantasy comes in uh saying, "Okay, well we're going to get influences from both." So they pulled in all of the like, you know, more more medieval type fantasies and mixed that in with some, you know, Japanese mix, right? So from from other like you see so many things that are from yokais and whatnot and it's it's some sort of interpretation of that and then on top of that they're like okay well what other interesting things can we do with it and they just really melded those two worlds in together yeah and that's what a lot of the early titles had
Um, I've seen s I, the one of the jokes that I've that I've had r regarding um, regarding the regarding the mythic influences of the summons has always been the question of Shiva. Yeah, because there because there's the joke of how do you go from the cre the creator destroyer god to an ice goddess. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta be cold to destroy it all. <laughs> and, well, Shiva in Hindu mythology is a creator and a destroyer. Mm -hmm. And is also male. Uh, but the theory that I've had, the theory that I've had is one of two things. Either A, they just liked the name and just went with, and just went with it, which is not all that uncommon. Or B... This was a it was a mistranslation of Shiver, which is the name of an ice nymph. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I would personally, with no backing on it whatsoever, way to prove it. But uh, <laughs> uh, off of my gut, I'd say it'd be the it'd be the former. It'd just be their their take on Shiva. Yeah, but uh, it's one geez. of those things where you can really go either way. But you had mentioned that you're that you're um set you're setting up to d to do the next demo I believe in May. Yes, that's our our current benchmark right now. Trying to get something nice and and tested and ready by May. Given that, what um what would you say were some of the big learning experiences you had with the first demo that you want to try and apply to the next? Uh a lot, actually, a lot. Uh, <laughs> well, obviously, we can't go through all of it, but do you have a few yeah, highlights that stick out to you if, if you were to turn this into a Rorschach test? Yes. So the uh, the first demo, uh, actually, I, I talk about how we've made that one in ten months. It's it's really we've made it in three. Uh, <laughs> We, we had a lot of the base systems that we were working on for a while, but then putting all the art together, make, uh, putting together the, the cutscenes and the stories and the quest lines and all that kind of stuff, it was all done in, in a span of like three months of real focus. Um, and there was a few things that, that kind of just had a weird effect when we did that. Uh, one of them is the, the exploration factor. So we had just these huge maps that we want to focus on making it feel like it was a forest. But then um, we also had this other thing where we didn't want the demo to be too short. So we had a lot of kind of going back and forth um, to go to different places to make sure that that the, the player was able to see all of the, the different areas that we built out for it. Mm -hmm. um, and what we got with that is just this thing where the most committed players would spend two hours trying to navigate around the forest just to complete pretty simple tasks. Um, so the biggest takeaway from it was uh, just scaling down the, the the areas and make it a little bit clearer where where to go, at least for the sake of a demo, right? When people are just coming on to, to, to get a feel of the game. So um, that's one of the biggest changes is, is gonna be the maps. Uh, we've already started scaling down the existing maps the other one is the story. The story was kind of rushed in terms of, well, how much do we want to say in this amount of time? Um, and how do we fit that in with the uh, with the quest system? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the two biggest takeaways is definitely the the maps themselves with the, the order in which you go to them. And the second would be the, the pacing of the story and the importance of it, right? And um, now there's smaller ones that weren't really takeaways. They were just kind of, we ran out of time when we were making the demo. We want to get it out before Kickstarter and, and be uh, bug, as close to as bug-free as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so we had the uh, the combat is relatively limited. Uh, there's only one weapon in the current demo with uh, with one attack as well as the, uh, the basic attack and then two enhancements to it. There's not too many um, enemies and... I think that's about it. Those are the, the biggest things that we're just, we ran out of time, right? So, you know, adding a bunch of enemies, making sure that we have the, at least two different weapons and having more uh, impactful fights, right? Yeah. So instead of fighting wolves and then you fight two wolves at the end, uh, we have more boss, mini boss kind of thing to uh, 
to gauge where you are and how you're you're growing as a character. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And um, I'm guessing that in the process of doing this, you had, you get you guys are pro- you guys um ended up agreed on getting more coffee than normal. Oh man, it's <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I'm on my like <laughs> I don't even know how many cups I've had today. I had, I had but, to bring uh, that up because of the cl- because of the clip from the Kickstarter video where uh, where um Al- where Alina is drinking it, yes. stri- drinking it straight from yes. the pot. <laughs> I hope that's not a habit in the office. Uh, uh next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can I kind of figured that it's not like I'm one to talk because I'm still banned from the coffee machine at my own office. Man, yeah. Yeah, I actually um I moved to an apartment out here. I'm I'm in Vegas now. I moved from Miami in order to be closer to the the game industry. And uh this apartment complex that I'm in has a coffee uh machine down at the bottom. And the uh all of my neighbors, everyone who lives there only knows me by the guy that's always by the coffee machine. So I'm always down there, and whenever I'm not down there, I have my espresso, my Italian coffee maker, like a that's on the stove, drip coffee, and French press. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, definitely an addiction. Yeah, um, I end up taking advantage of that at work with some of my co- with some of my colleagues, and because of that, I am not allowed near the coffee machine without supervision because they they didn't like that I switched it that I switched out a bunch of stuff so they're drinking decaf and things that you should not be putting into um coffee like flour oh no <laughs> yeah no that's 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 not great no it isn't but neither is neither is giving a guy with a chocolate allergy a chocolate cake on his birthday oh no that's yeah <laughs> but um with all of, with all of that said i cer- i'm certainly going to be looking forward to seeing how rising spire develops and I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. No, of course. I thank you for having me. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As <laughs> I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh man, you catch me near the end of the week, at the end of the day, and uh, and I may be I may be there with you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>